What's going on, everyone? This is Ryan Eckert with Peak Endurance Solutions, and you're listening to the VO2 Max podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the VO2 Max podcast. And if this is your first time listening to this podcast, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode and you continue to tune into future episodes, um, today's episode is going to be all about the relationship between training volume and uh, triathlon performance, more specifically performance at the longer distance uh, of triathlon. So things such as Ironman 70.3 and Ironman distance triathlon races. Um, I'm going to focus my conversation around a very recent 2021 study that I'm going to reference um, I'm going to use that kind of as the basis upon which I build the discussion that, uh, or build the case for the relationship between training volume and performance at um, specifically Ironman distance racing. Um, and this is a really good study just to kind of highlight some important take home messages that relate to the relationship between overall training volume and then performance in general. Um, so before I get into that specific study though, let's start by just talking a little bit about training volume. Um, so training volume, it can be measured in a couple different ways. Usually the most common way of measuring overall training volume is how many hours a week are you training as an athlete? Um, so especially with triathlon where there's different types of disciplines. So there's swimming, which has like swim yardage. There's cycling, which is usually done in miles and then running, which is also done in miles. Um, but a really, really easy way of tallying everything up. You can do, uh, you can obviously track the distance. So like swim yard, Uh, swim yardage, uh, bike mileage, and run mileage. Um, But usually, to make things simpler for triathletes, triathletes tend to measure overall training volume with the number of hours per week that they're training. Um, Whereas, for example, uh, runners who just focus specifically on running, they might measure their weekly training volume in mileage. Um, So friends that I have or athletes that I I know that just focus on running, um, they'll usually reference their weekly uh, training volume in terms of their mileage. And then it's really common when you're talking to a triathlete to talk about how many hours per week that they train. Um, So for the purpose of this discussion, um, seeing as it's going to relate specifically to triathlon performance, we're going to talk about training volume in terms of the number of hours per week. Um, There are other ways of breaking down training volume. by bringing in things such as like training frequency and how often you train and how many hours per day you train. But we're just going to focus specifically on training volume being um, the number of hours per week that an athlete is training. So with triathlon, just because there are multiple disciplines compared to a single sport, um, such as running, cycling, or swimming, um, usually triathletes tend to train a lot. And even amateur triathletes, so age group triathletes, will also train a lot, especially compared to other single sport athletes. Um, So it's not uncommon to see um, triathletes, especially those that are training for the longer distance triathlons like half Ironmans and the full distance Ironman events, um, to be training anywhere between like 10 and 20 hours a week, depending on the time of year and how close they are to their their event. Um, And 10 to 20 hours a week is a lot, so you'll be hard pressed to find, for example, professional or elite runners that train 10 to 20 hours a week. And that's mainly just because with that sport, uh, because running is so, so high impact, they can't necessarily be doing you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week of running because they would just break down and get injured. Um, but it's still a lot, and especially compared to, um, you know, say, like professional swimmers or professional cyclists. Um, 10 to 20 hours a week is a lot of training. Um, and so professional triathletes will train even more than that, sometimes training upwards of 30 to 40 hours a week. Um, And so it's a lot of training and and a very high training volume that both age groupers and professionals are doing on a weekly basis. And so age groupers, obviously, and amateurs, they have other life stresses um, to deal with as they're fitting in their their swimming and biking and run training. Um, And so usually their training volume is obviously a little bit lower than, say, a professional because of that. Um, But relatively speaking, when you take into consideration, you know, working and family commitments and social commitments and other things like that, that an age grouper will have 10, 15, 20 hours a week becomes a lot of training. And it almost, you know, gives the same physiologic or provides them the same physiological demand um, that, say, a professional who's training 25, 30, 35 hours a week is experiencing just because they have all the other life stresses on top of it. Um, And then the professionals, obviously, they might have less 
life stresses um, and other things that they need to do on a daily basis, especially if they're like a full-time professional triathlete, not working any kind of side job. Some will maybe do some coaching on the side um, or do some other things that are related to, you know, like sponsor commitments, um, things of that nature. But they're usually more focused on just the training and the recovery day in, day out. Um, and so they can afford to put in some more volume and, and still be able to recover from it. Um, so for amateurs, not uncommon to see 15 to 20 hour training weeks at the peak, especially for the longer distance events. Um, and then for professionals, like I said, there are some that train upwards of 35 to 40 hours a week at their peak um, when they're getting ready for something like an Ironman 70.3 or more specifically an Ironman distance event. Um, so training volume. Um, there's this concept or this thought amongst a lot of triathletes that the more you do, the better. And this is true to a certain extent. So if you are a, let's say you're an amateur triathlete who's trying to get better at the Ironman distance, if you're training 10 hours a week for a couple years and then the next couple years as you kind of progress and you get better and you get fitter, you start to train on average say 12 to 13 to 14 hours a week, um, yes, that might be better, especially as you're getting fitter and you're adapting to training volumes, um, doing a little bit more is sometimes going to be better and will sometimes yield better results. Um, but most triathletes have this misconception that always doing more is always going to be or doing more is always going to be better and it's always going to yield better results and so i'll premise this discussion around training more training volume is better if you can recover from it adequately and so with professionals for example they have things a little bit easier on that front in the sense that they can usually for the most part train and then they have all the extra time around their training to focus on recovery and doing nothing so that they can hopefully recover uh, from their high volumes of training that they sustain. Whereas age groupers and amateurs on the other hand, they might be able to fit in a lot of training, like say relatively speaking for, a, for an age grouper, let's say someone can do 15 to 20 hours a week around all their other commitments. Um, but if they're not getting enough sleep and if they're constantly on the go in between and around training sessions, then they might not adequately be recovering from that training. And so in some cases with some amateurs who try and layer on more and more and more training, um, it's not always better if they can't recover from it. And obviously that goes for professional triathletes as well, but their circumstances are just different. So usually when they're doing more and more training volume, most of the time, not always, depending on the professionals, uh, the professional triathlete circumstances, um, but they'll usually be able to have the time to, you know, get that extra hour or two of sleep at night. Um, they'll have the time or the ability to kind of kick their feet up in between training sessions and take a nap or just kind of chill out and watch TV and read a book. Um, so sometimes you have to talk about training volume. Um, separately when it comes to professionals versus amateurs. Now, I'm going to be focusing mainly on amateurs and age groupers um, moving forward because that's going to be the study that I reference is going to include amateur uh, or age group triathletes. Uh, but I did want to make sure that I referenced professionals as well or even like elites maybe who are just working kind of part time um, trying to go for the professional license and they may be, maybe have more time to train and recover as well. Um, but moving forward with this conversation, it's going to be mostly focused on the average age grouper or amateur who has, you know, other normal life commitments like having to work full time or part time, um, having to take care of their family, provide for their family, and then other things such as, you know, social commitments and things like that. Um, so more training volume doesn't always necessarily yield better performance. Um, and so the study that I'm going to talk about next has a few take home messages that are going to highlight this point very nicely. Um, so this study was a 2021 study, so published very, very recently this year. Um, and essentially what the researchers did in this study is they took 99 age group triathletes who are participating in the 2019 Ironman Brazil. Um, there's about 80 men, 19 women, so a little bit uh, heavier on the, on the male side of things. Um, but they took these triathletes, um, they had them complete an online questionnaire about 40 days out from the race, so a little over a month out from Ironman Brazil in 2019. Um, and within that questionnaire, they asked them questions related to their weekly training volume, um, previous Ironman racing experience, how much sleep they're getting each night. Um, and then they also asked them about signs and symptoms related to overtraining. 
And so for those of you who aren't familiar with overtraining, overtraining is essentially what happens when um, you try and do too much uh, or you go too hard for too long and you're not recovering adequately enough. Um, you can kind of get into this state of like chronic fatigue and burnout, which uh, from an athletic perspective is usually coined overtraining. Um, now signs and symptoms of overtraining are things like unintentional weight loss, um, a decrease in performance or, or a sudden uh, decrease in performance that isn't necessarily explained by anything else, um, loss of energy and feelings of fatigue, and there's, there's more symptoms than just that, but those are just some of the bigger ones. Um, so within the questionnaire that they administer to these athletes, they ask them questions related to uh, signs and symptoms uh, of overtraining. And then they essentially gave them that questionnaire and then on, uh, they gave them that questionnaire about 40 days out from race day and then they recorded their actual race time at the 2019 Ironman Brazil. And then they were essentially just looking for relationships between uh, self-reported variables from that questionnaire that they administered to the athletes uh, 40 days before race day and their overall race time at the actual Ironman Brazil race. Um, so I'm going to highlight some of, uh, or at least what I thought were three of the most interesting findings that came from this study. Um, so first off, total race time, as well as individual swim, bike, and run times were not significantly different between the athletes that trained up to 14 hours a week, between 15 to 20 hours a week, and then more than 20 hours a week. Um, and I will get into more specifics um, as far as like, what this means, but this is probably one of the bigger findings from this study, but I'll wait to go over the, the next couple before I dive into each one individually in more detail. Um, so that was number one. Number two, um, triathletes that reported overtraining related symptoms. So again, things such as like unintentional weight loss, loss of energy, um, sudden decreases in performance that weren't explained by anything else. Those triathletes did significantly worse um, in other words, slower race times than those that did not report those overtraining related symptoms. And then number three, triathletes that had a prior Ironman or had previous Ironman distance racing experience did significantly better with faster race times um, than those that did not have previous Ironman distance racing experience. So circling back to that first uh, main uh, or major takeaway from this study or major finding from this study. Um, so those that trained less than 14 hours a week didn't necessarily do uh, any worse than those that trained 15 to 20 hours a week or more than 20 hours a week. And actually when you go and you look at these results in more detail, those that trained the most, even though it wasn't necessarily statistically significant in their findings, um, but when you look at like some of the graphs and the, and the tables that they provide, um, those that trained the most actually had slightly slower race time. So they didn't do any better than those athletes that were training on the lower end of the spectrum in this study, which was less than 14 hours a week. Um, and so that's pretty significant because you would think, or at least most age group or amateur triathletes would think that if they had a pool of athletes who were training 14 hours a week or less, and then they had another pool of athletes who were training a little bit more, so 15 to 20 hours a week, and then they had another pool of athletes who was training more than 20 hours a week, most amateur or age group athletes would probably say, yeah, those that are training 20 hours a week, especially for an Ironman distance race, those athletes are probably going to do better than those who are training less. And it's really, you know, it seems to be intuitive or to make sense. You would think, oh, it's a, you know, an Ironman distance race is a really, really long race for most people. Um, I think the average finishing time from this study uh, was like 11 to 13 hours, depending on if it was a, a man versus a woman. Um, so, you know, for most athletes, it was 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours, so long day. So they would think that the more the athlete is training, the faster they're going to end up being on race day. But at least with this particular study, that was not the case. Those that were training the most had the slowest overall race times. Um, and then going back to that second interesting finding that I mentioned, those that had reported overtraining related symptoms did significantly worse than those that did not report the symptoms. And so essentially what this is saying is, and we don't necessarily know if those that had overtraining related symptoms actually had um, like a case of overtraining or burnout syndrome. 
Um, but they had just reported symptoms that are related to overtraining. And so they could have been, say, like in the early stages of an overtraining related syndrome, and they had some of these symptoms, but maybe they didn't have a full blown case of burnout or overtraining. Um, they may have had overtraining syndrome, um, but there was no way of actually assessing whether or not these people had overtraining in this particular study, or at least the researchers didn't do it. They just asked them questions related to overtraining. Um, but those who reported symptoms that were related to overtraining raced slower than those that did not. And this kind of makes sense because someone with overtraining related uh, or with burnout syndrome or overtraining syndrome, um, they're obviously going to perform way worse than someone who doesn't have it. And so in this particular study, if these individuals were developing overtraining syndrome or if they already had it, um, then of course they're going to be racing slower uh, than those who don't have it. And then the third major finding is also one that is kind of intuitive as well, but those that have prior Ironman distance racing experience did better than those that did not. And so one uh, reason for this potentially is uh, because, especially long distance triathlon, there's so many things that you learn through experience on how to do better and how to go faster. Um, it makes sense that those who usually have more experience tend to do better than those who have no experience. Uh, especially when it comes to long distance triathlon races like Ironman distance races. Um, usually the first one that you do, if you have ever done one or if you've never done one, usually the first one that you do, you're going to learn about a thousand different things that you could have done better. Um, everything related to pacing, to the type of equipment you use, um, to how you set up your transition or what you include in your transition area, um, to your nutrition and fueling throughout the day. Um, to like the kit that you're wearing, like everything has an impact on your performance at that point because it's such a long day that everything you do tends to have an impact somehow on how you perform. And so usually you just learn a lot of lessons as you do your first couple races. Um, so it kind of makes intuitive sense that those who had the experience have probably learned these lessons over time on like which equipment to use, what kind of kit to wear, how to pace themselves appropriately, how to fuel themselves appropriately. And so those decisions are all going to lead to performing better um, than those who say maybe don't. Even if those who had never done an Ironman before in this particular study, even if they were, say, objectively fitter in terms of the type of like power they could produce on the bike or the kind of run speeds that they could produce on the run, um, even if they were fitter, a lot of those things such as pacing and fueling um, – have a significant impact on performance. So someone who is less fit might be able to perform better than someone who's more fit um, if they have that previous racing experience. Um, and so that one kind of makes sense. But even though there are some limitations to this study, such as the fact that um, it's just like a, a, it's basically getting a snapshot uh, from a single point in time from these participants uh, because the researchers only asked them the questionnaire at one time point, which was again about a month out from race day. Um, and then they just looked at their performance uh, on race day. So a big limitation is that they didn't necessarily follow them over time and they didn't necessarily get more data points in terms of um, these overtraining related symptoms and then how often they're training and uh, things such as like how much they're sleeping each night. Um, we probably could have had a more complete picture of, of each individual athlete um, if they had tracked them multiple times leading up to race day. So there's one limitation there. Um, and then again, we don't know if those who actually reported symptoms related to overtraining had overtraining syndrome or not. Um, we just know if they reported symptoms that are related to overtraining. And then we also don't necessarily know anything about what they did on actual race day. So we don't necessarily know how they fueled or hydrated themselves or how they paced themselves. Um, and so there are some potential confounding factors that could play into the uh, results or their, or their times come race day. Um, you could have had a group of athletes who just like objectively botched, you know, nutrition and fueling or pacing, and that could have had a significant impact on uh, their race times. And they might have gone a lot slower because of that. Um, and so things like that weren't necessarily assessed in this study either. Um, so there are a variety of limitations to this study, obviously, but um, the reason I wanted to talk about this one in particular was, first off, it was so recent, um, and then it included nearly 100 triathletes who did a, like a well-known Ironman-branded race, Ironman Brazil, back in 2019. 
Um, but also that one of the major findings was that those who trained more than 20 hours a week raced, even though it wasn't statistically significant, they raced slightly slower than those who trained less than 14 hours a week or up to 14 hours a week. Um, which is crazy when you think about it because most triathletes, again, would think that the more you train, the fitter you're going to get. And so this study just kind of highlights very nicely that that's not always the case, especially for the average age group or amateur triathlete. It's, again, like I said, a little bit different when it comes to professionals. Um, but when it comes to amateurs and age groupers, training more doesn't always necessarily yield better results. And so the reason for this being, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, more is better if you can recover from it and you can recover adequately from it. So for example, let's say we have just kind of your average, typical, you know, middle-aged adult triathlete who's in their 40s, they have a family, they have a full-time job um, on top of other just life commitments surrounding their family and their work. Um, And it's really common, you know, the most popular age group in Ironman distance uh, racing, at least across amateurs, is I believe it's like the 35 to 39 and 40 to 44 and 45 to 49 for men. Like those three age brackets are huge. And if you go look at any um, any Ironman distance race and you go down to the results section, like all those age groups from 35 to like 50 um, are just massive. They are usually the bulk of the race. And so let's just say we take kind of your you know, stereotypical amateur triathlete from one of those age groups, most of them are going to have some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, stressful full-time job. Um, it's really common to see triathletes who are kind of very, very type A personalities. And so they tend to also be high performers in other areas of their life. And so they're doctors or lawyers or CEOs, or they have high positions in, uh, in business for a company. And so usually they have a busy work schedule. They usually have some kind of family, um, and then they'll obviously have other life commitments around that. Now, if we take that kind of athlete and they can handle 10 hours of training a week and they're building for an Ironman, um, at a certain point, there's going to be a certain number of hours per week where they just ha- they can't recover from it because it's eating too much into their ability to get enough sleep each night or to just have some time throughout the day where they're just relaxing and they're not doing anything. Um, so... That's that kind of limit that most amateurs have to find. And so if that limit for that athlete is, let's say, 14 hours a week, um, and if they start to go up to 15, 16, 17 hours a week and it's too much for them, then that extra two to three hours of training that they're doing each week, especially if they're doing it for weeks and weeks and months and months on end, and they can't recover well from it, then eventually it's going to start to actually hurt their performance. And eventually, if it's done long enough and they ignore some of the initial signs of pushing themselves too hard, it can eventually develop into what's called overreaching, which is the initial stage uh, that comes before overtraining syndrome. Um, But overreaching is where you start to see like fatigue pop up and some other symptoms might pop up, like your performance suffers a little bit, your rating of perceived exertion is up uh, for the same given effort levels. Um, that you might have had before in training sessions. For some people, their heart rate can be really, really low in certain training sessions, even though their perceived exertion is like through the roof. Um, Some people's resting heart rate can be elevated. Some people's heart rate variability can be a little out of whack when they get into that overreaching phase. And then if they go through and they push through that long enough, that's when they can develop full-blown overtraining syndrome, which is actually a really, really serious syndrome. Um, And it can take six to 12 months to recover from for a lot of people because at that point you start to get some hormonal imbalances that pop up um, and you're just physiologically burnt out and just fried to a crisp. Um, And so it can take a while for the body to kind of reach its homeostasis or balance point again. Um, So don't tread lightly when it comes to overtraining uh, syndrome because it is a pretty serious syndrome and it has ruined some professional athletes uh, careers as well. And so you definitely want to avoid that at all costs if you're an athlete in any sense of the word. Um, So the key with most athletes is to, especially those that are training for really, really long distance events, is not to just do more. More isn't always better. It's to find the amount where you're pushing the limit a little bit, um, but you're still able to adequately recover from it. So again, for most amateur triathletes, um, it might not be 20 hours a week. 
you could have, like I said, a middle-aged uh, triathlete, full-time job, family, all that stuff. And maybe for them, 13 to 14 hours a week is what they can build up to for their peak. Um, I actually had a triathlete that I worked with back when he was getting ready for the 2019 Ironman Arizona. Um, and he's really, 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 really busy with his job. He, um, he co-owns um, a veterinary, uh, a vet clinic. Um, and he is crazy busy with his work can sometimes be working up to 50 or 60 hours a week and on top of you know having to manage the stresses that comes with co-owning a, a clinic um, and then he has a family on top of that with a wife and kids and pets um, and then just other life commitments around that and so for him I think we might have built up to a peak of if I remember correctly it was probably no more than like 13 or 14 hours a week of training and that was for a very very short period of time and I remember when we were at that point where we were building up to 13 to 14 hours a week for a few weeks before he started to taper, um, it was like his limit for him. Like he was approaching his limit in terms of how much he could like physically fit in without it starting to affect other areas of his life and how he was feeling. Um, and so for him, there's no way that 20 hours a week would have been beneficial for him. Whereas let's say we flip it and we go to... Um, I know there are some triathletes, um, I, or I know of some triathletes who are just like fresh out of college, um, and they don't necessarily have, you know, a wife or, or kids or a husband or kids yet. Um, and they might just have started out with their career and they're working 30, 35, 40 hours a week. Um, or maybe they're just working part time. Um, and so they have so much more time and availability to train. And so for them, 14 hours a week might not necessarily be pushing their limit. And they might be able to handle 15 to 20 hours a week of training or even more. Um, so it's just so individual for every athlete. Um, and this study kind of highlights the, at least the, the general fact that more isn't always better. And it all just comes down to individually, you have to look at the big picture of what each athlete is doing outside of triathlon and then factor all that in and take that into account when you prescribe, whether it's a coach prescribing it to you or it's yourself prescribing it if you're self-coached, how much total training volume you can build up to when you're getting ready for a long distance triathlon race. Um, so don't fall into the trap that more is always better because more isn't always better and sometimes more can lead to worse performance, um, worse performance initially, uh, but worst case scenario, it can lead to something like overtraining or burnout syndrome. Um, and so be very careful, obviously, with how much training volume um, you're prescribing or your coach is giving to you. Um, so if you're self-coached, just be aware of all this stuff. And if you're working with a coach, just be sure that you're really open with your coach and you're having honest discussions about, you know, how your work is impacting you and how busy it is and how stressful it is. And if you do have a family um, and a significant other that, that you're taking care of and you want to spend time with and just be open with your coach about that. Um, so that you're making sure that they're not giving you too much um, because it can eventually lead to some pretty uh, pretty negative outcomes if you're not careful with it. Um, and again, I only talked about training volume in this uh, in this podcast discussion, uh, but training intensity is a whole other factor that I didn't really get into. And so usually training is a balance of volume and intensity, um, and volume will sometimes go up at certain times of the year, um, and intensity will go down. And uh, at other times of the year, it might be flipped and intensity might go up and volume might, might be lower. Um, but usually training is a product of, or at least performance ends up being a product of training volume and training intensity. Um, and so I focused mainly on training volume, but just also keep in mind that training intensity plays a role as well. And so even if you're not doing crazy amounts of volume, um, you, there's still a limit for the amount of intensity that everyone can handle each week as well. Um, and if you are more interested in a discussion around intensity, I'll be sure to link in, um, I think it's like episode three or four that I did on the VO2 Max podcast where I discuss um, the, the topic of training intensity and how to balance it. Um, there's this concept called polarized training intensity distribution. Um, and so that's basically what that whole entire episode focuses on is I discuss training intensity and how to and how to prescribe it and how to balance it um, on a weekly basis. And so I'll be sure to link that into the show notes below. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed today's episode um, as it's centered around the relationship between training volume and long distance triathlon performance. 
Um, as always, if you have any questions related to this podcast episode, uh, feel free to shoot me an email at peakendurancesolutions at outlook.com. Thanks for tuning into this episode, and hopefully you'll tune again into or you'll tune in again for future episodes. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you liked what you heard in today's episode, please feel free to leave us a review. Those reviews are greatly appreciated and help spread the word about our podcast as well as help us improve the content that we deliver to our listeners. And then finally, if you know of anyone who would be interested in listening to our podcast, please go ahead and share our podcast with them.